we will now have a time for the audience to ask questions. Uh, the protocol that we're going to use is there are uh, one, there's one microphone on each side of uh, the auditorium, and we're going to ask people to line up at those uh, microphones if they wish to ask a question. Um, if uh, we have a large number, we may try to give priority to uh, students. Um, we're also going to try to make sure we have an equal number of questions for uh, each speaker. So I'll uh, go in blocks of two, uh, taking one question for each speaker, and then move to the other side of the auditorium. Uh, while those of you who may want to ask questions are moving to the microphones, let me also uh, remind you that you received comment cards as you were coming in. If you have any reactions to uh, today's debate, uh, I would encourage you to fill those out and hand those in as you exit. Um, I would also remind you that there are uh, going to be uh, CDs available of this debate if you'd like to reserve one. Uh, those are available for uh, $2 after uh, the debate is over. Um, I would ask you uh, to quiet down again uh, and uh, try to give our full attention to the speakers uh, and to the questioners. So as you are asking your questions, I would remind you to keep them brief. Uh, if they get too long, I will uh, cut you off to make sure that there's enough time for other people to uh, ask more questions uh, before our time is up. Go ahead. I'd first like to thank you for coming. but. I'd like to question you on your tactics. I kept tally of the number of logical fallacies you committed, and it was 25, the highlights of which were four occurrences of shifting the burden of proof, three occurrences of argumentum ad populi, and I'll skip over all the others to get to the highlight. Within 60 seconds of standing at the podium, you committed argumentum ad hominem, the equivalent of a five-year-old calling names. Shame on you. All right. Shame on yeah, you. Yeah, shame on me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm also a professional philosopher as well as a New Testament theologian. I understand logic. Well, uh, obviously, you have no self-control. Allow the speaker to answer the question, please. Um, shame on you. Floors. Uh, Will the audience please? Yeah. Be quiet so the speaker can I, I don't think I committed any of these informal logical fallacies. Uh, I think all of my arguments are carefully formulated according to the canons of, of logical inference. I do want to say something, though, about the ad hominem point, because uh, I felt very uncomfortable about opening as I did, but I felt I had to do it in light of what I had seen in this earlier debate by way of preempting that happening in tonight's debate, because in front of an untrained audience of undergraduates, misimpressions can arise, and so that was why I did that. I, I, I didn't like doing that, but I felt it was necessary in order that we conduct this debate according to professional rules of, of etiquette and decorum. But I don't think that was ad hominem, because I wasn't saying that what Dr. Avalos said was false uh, because of anything about him. That's what ad hominem means, is that you say a position is false by attacking the person, and I never suggested anything of that sort. So um, I think that the, the charge is not correct. You tried oh, to... Uh, your question's been answered. Um, I don't... Is this microphone on? Yeah. Uh, who's, the, who's your question for? Yes. Um, for uh, Dr. Craig. Okay, go ahead. Or Lane. Uh, the purpose or the value of any explanation is to reduce the level of confusion and the amount of mystery that the alleged facts seem to entail. However, to invoke the supernatural, whether it be God or miracles or whatever, a supernatural agency in a proposed explanation is to bring infinitely more mystery, infinitely more confusion into the explanation than could possibly have been present in the original facts. So it seems to me that by invoking the supernatural to explain the alleged resurrection, you have brought more mystery into the uh, resurrection than the natural hypotheses that were detailed by Professor Avalos. All right, that, that's a good question. Um, when you say that the purpose of explanation is to reduce mystery, I think what that means is to reduce the mystery about that particular item which is to be explained. 
But it doesn't mean to reduce sort of the overall mystery. Uh, indeed, in invoking the, a new explanation, you might create new mysteries that then opens up new questions. And great examples of this would be quantum theory in physics. Um, in order to explain certain sorts of experimental results, we need to invoke things like quantum indeterminacy, quarks, maybe strings, all sorts of high-level theoretical entities in physics, which, as any quantum physicist will tell you, invoke levels of mystery that just boggle the mind. Nevertheless, you have good reason for believing in these posited entities as the causes or explanations of the particular phenomenon in question. So I would agree with you. Positing the existence of God raises all kinds of different interesting questions uh, that I, as a philosopher, am extremely interested in, but that doesn't do anything to suggest that this is not the best explanation of the facts of the empty tomb, the origin of the Christian faith, and the resurrection appearances. When I compare it to these other naturalistic explanations, I find that they all are deficient in their explanatory power, explanatory scope, plausibility, and and other objective criteria that one uses to determine the best explanation. Uh, could I have the next person in line here with a question for Dr. Avalos? Yeah, that's me. Go. Um, I think the actual question here tonight was, um, is the Christian faith fact or fiction? Now, as a Christian, if you, we believe in God. If we believe in God, we believe in the word of God. If we believe in the word of God, then we believe in the resurrection. Now, you don't believe in God, so you don't believe in the Word of God, so you don't believe in the rection. So what is the point of life? Uh, please be quiet so the speaker can answer the question. The point of life is to live as healthy as possible in healthy relationships. To me, the basis of all life is good relationships, fellow human beings, Wife, kids, whatever. That's the point of life. 